Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. So it's, it's ever so slightly warmer inside the room by maybe three degrees. But that's three degrees we want to give you. So if you want to come inside, come grab seats, and we'll get started shortly. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad you're here. Happy Monday morning. How are you all? Good. 
Um, it's a thrill to have so many people here at the Poetry Center to help us celebrate today. We're very grateful for that. My name is Tyler Meyer. I work here as the director at the Poetry Center. We first and foremost want to welcome all of you to this space. We're so proud to have uh, this audience and to be doing this work we're going to do together today, which we're incredibly grateful for. Um, I want to acknowledge some, some of our leaders who are here, university leadership who are here, our president, Robert Robbins, uh, other senior leadership from the university, uh, the Dean of the College of Humanities, Dorenstein, uh, um, Alain Philippe Durand, our Senior Vice President, Levi Escara, uh, for the Native American Advancement and Tribal Engagement, uh, leadership uh, from the tribe and the Tribal Council from the Fort Yuma Quetzan, which we're grateful for, including uh, John Coutin and Gloria McGee, uh, and then the whole delegation that's here from the Fort Yuma Quetzan. Thank you so much for coming to be here with us today. Thank you. Um, the Fort Yuma Youth Group is here to, as, as, and will perform with us as well, which we're very excited about. And I also want to recognize one more name that I didn't mention before, and that's Juanita Rodriguez. Thank you again, all of you, for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'll begin with the land acknowledgement that we use here at the University of Arizona that was developed in partnership uh, with many of the tribes here in Arizona, and it's presented behind me as well. We respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Atam and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Uh, there's an exciting little program that we have for you. So we're going to get right to that. But there'll be some remarks from leadership to begin. And we're um, thrilled for that. We'll go through that first. Uh, then we'll have a reading uh, from a great friend of the Poetry Center in the University of Arizona, Deborah Jackson Taffa, from her brand new memoir, Whiskey Tender. We'll have a performance from R. Carlos Nakai uh, on, the, on the flute, which we're so thrilled for and excited to celebrate. When those pieces are completed, we'll move together out to the sign, which is just to my left, right outside here. So, and we'll have the unveiling of the sign at that moment uh, with the Quetzal language included in that sign, which we're thrilled. And we'll talk more about that as we move out to that space. Um, but to get us started, I want to welcome up a great friend of the Poetry Center, uh, Ophelia Zepeda, a Regents Professor here at the University of Arizona in Linguistics a tremendous poet and friend of the Poetry Center. Um, if you have a chance to step into the Poetry Center afterwards, you'll see that our display cases are empty. And that's because we have an exciting new exhibit coming up in partnership with the Center for Creative Photography uh, that features Ophelia's work along with some photographers uh, and other collaborators. And that's called The Place Where Clouds Are Formed. And that exhibit will be up in April. We're so excited for that. But please help me welcome Ophelia. And <laughs> And you may have a tie, a caramasha macodet, that the chipkin with a bag, a autumn yock, a chipkin duck. In Banyard, the most is good, I should eat them at the Matabaju, Matanoa, Nancomas, autumn yock, hookage, and all hack a chirk, eat a key, moyaku, eat a poetry center. The Biarsha chip and chim and suffer that from Twosi Tata. Yao Jenik, Yao Humapai, Yao Ka Ida Matskurko Muinya, Mumtio Ka Ida Matio Chichwi, Kamjid Earth, Kahu Ton Autumn, Majurica Amjit, the worst of Ton Autumn, Bashatum Che, Machisafta, Mumtia Tata, Yasapo Oyo Port Ea Chuk Shonam. It's my very ple uh, great pleasure to welcome all of you. Again, as uh, my friend Tyler said, my name is Ophelia Cepeda, and I of the Autumn Nation here, and I'm also a faculty here at the University of Arizona in the Department of Linguistics, and I'm director of the American Indian Language Development Institute. 
the American Indian Language Institute was the one who started the initiative with the um, uh, signage in the various languages uh, around campus so many years ago. And so we are very happy that the signage uh, is now becoming permanent. And uh, it's just great, uh, great to have that visibility for all of the languages of Arizona um, and the Southwest. Um, again, I want to welcome you on behalf of, of course, uh, our campus. And um, here to this region, the traditional home of the Tohono O'odham, on behalf of the Tohono O'odham Nation, I want to welcome you to um, the community of Chukshon, Tucson, and also, of course, what we know as the Tohono, um, the homeland of the O'odham. So I wish uh, everyone a very nice event this morning. I'm sorry that I do need to rush off in a little bit. I have classes. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I hope uh, everyone has a wonderful time. Thank you so much. Okay, it's my pleasure now to welcome up Levi Esquera, the Senior Vice President for Native American Advancement and Tribal Engagement. He'll tell us more about the sign naming initiative here at the university. Levi. Thank you so much, Tyler. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Cepeda for being here today. And more importantly, uh, when our office was established a little over three years ago, I met with the linguistics department, Heidi, Natasha, and they spoke of this vision that Dr. Zapata had, that uh, one, one day out of every week, or every month, they would put up uh, temporary signage. And they wanted to have permanent signage. They actually had uh, three requests, and one of them was this. And we're seeing this become a reality. So Dr. Zapata, we hope that we're able to meet your, your goals and your dreams of this along with the linguistics department. It's, it's amazing. So the initiative, as you know, is, is we wanna take temporary signage and we wanna make it permanent for our native students when they come, they feel a place of a sense of home. Our very first sign was the communications building. And Dr. Cepeda talked about that. It was, it was uh, where she primarily teaches at. And we had a visiting uh, tribal chairman from another tribe, Ak Chin, that speaks Otham. We walked by the sign and he actually just stopped and looked at it for a while and he talked about his daughter, who is now I think 13, 14 at the time, I think she was only 11, saying, you know what, Levi, she's gonna wanna come here and this will be a place where she'll feel at home because she can see her language and what it represents here. And that's the passion of why we're doing this. So I thank you for that. And now, not to be all serious, because sometimes I don't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to about someone. Joan Jackson, please stand. This is my friend, Joan. <laughs> Joan actually works for Ak Shan and she learned of this project and she was eager to submit something in behalf of her tribe, Fort Yuma Ketsan. So this wouldn't be a reality without her stepping up. So I wanted to embarrass her, but more importantly, I wanted to recognize and honor her. So thank you for being here. Now she gives me that mean look. <laughs> It's all right, we go back a ways, we're good. <laughs> Secondly, I wanna recognize my staff, Tina, who's uh, did a lot of work in making this become a reality. Uh, and then also Jacqueline, who's running point person on our, our linguistic sign project. Both of them have done a marvelous job in actually bringing this to, to become a reality. And finally, I wanna say this. Uh, the University of Arizona uh, is my home. And I don't say that lightly. I've been here for a little over three years, but this is home. And any time that we can highlight and celebrate our culture with others, we need to do it. Because we have a rich history. Arizona might be home of 22 federally recognized tribes, but there's a lot more tribes that called Arizona home at one time or another. And so I would hope that when you get a chance to, to reflect on some of the things you hear today, put it into action because it's great to be a wildcat. And in my language, we say that, Tacopa. So I hope all of you could be Tacopas today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Levi. 
Um, I want to welcome up the Dorans Dean of the College of Humanities, Alain Philippe Durand. The Poetry Center is part of the College of Humanities, and so on behalf of the college, I want to welcome up Dorans Dean Durand. Thank you, Taylor. Um, good morning. On behalf of all of us in the College of Humanities, I would like to thank and welcome everyone who has gathered today. We are honored to be here for this dedic uh, design, dedication, and celebration. Indeed, this project at the university aligns very well with the College of Humanities' mission and values, such as to promote collaboration, critical thinking, tempered by empathy and openness, and eager engagement with ideas, languages, literatures, and cultures and also to ensure that all voices are heard with the aim of making the world a more just, equitable, and inclusive place. Our college is deeply committed and invested in language and language work, how our cultures and heritages are held in language. When we study languages, we are studying what connects us and keeps us in relationship with one another. Finally, there is no better place, I think, than the Poetry Center for this partnership, which is an essential space on campus devoted to profound and moving experiences with languages. Thank you again, and welcome. Many thanks for that, AP. It's my great pleasure to welcome up the University of Arizona President Robert Robbins to say a couple of words on behalf of the university in this initiative. Dr. Robbins. Thank you, Tyler, and good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to uh, welcome, uh, in particular, the Fort Yuma Katsan uh, Tribal Delegation to the University of Arizona. And for those of you who I've, who I've met, uh, Council Member Jonathan Katin uh, and uh, Council Member uh, Gloria McGee, who I, I met earlier as well. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, hearing from author Deborah Jackson Taffa uh, from her, her new memoir, uh, Whiskey Tinder, and I got to meet her and her husband earlier today and the Jackson family who, who are here traveling to support her. Thank you for being here for the Festival of Books uh, over the weekend. Um, Professor Sabata, thank you for being here as always, and thank you for the vision for this project. Uh, the, the partnership between you and Levi uh, has been tremendous, and I think this is the one, two, three, four, fifth, fourth? We have, we have seven signs up, but this is the third dedication. Third dedication. Oh. Well, we had communications, Old Main, uh, four. four. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, <laughs> McHale Center, and now here, the Poetry Center, which I agree is the perfect location uh, for, uh, for this um, uh, this theme of in silence we can listen and uh, believe me I, I'm doing a lot of listening to, uh, these days uh, because it's not always silent. Um, we're, we're grateful for the partnership uh, that we have with all the 22 nations but I, I think Levi uh, it's hard to believe it's been three years you've been here. You've transformed our relationship with the, with the nations and today is another manifestation of that. And I would like to uh, thank the Fort Yuma uh, Katsan tribe um, who, who chose this particular project. Uh, as I said before, it's a collaboration with efforts from many different people. Uh, we have cooperative extension offices in, in Yuma County, and we're always looking uh, for ways to work together and to fulfill our land grant mission by serving our state and our, our community. The Office of Native American Advancement and Tribal Engagement uh, this year has been working with entrepreneurs from the uh, Katsan tribe through native, the Native Forbes project uh, process. Um, this is a unique entrepreneurial community that combines startup acceleration alongside experimental student and community education. It was funded by a five-year matching grant from the U.S. Uh, Economic Development Administration, and, and we're so lucky to have uh, the FORGE project. Uh, this year, we welcome four uh, of San Carlos Apache students to, to our main campus, who I got to meet at the last sign dedication 
uh, at the uh, football stadium. So uh, I'm looking forward to the reading, uh, Deborah, and uh, thank you all for being here for this very special occasion. Uh, as I said before, I can't imagine a better setting than the Poetry Center for the, the sign project. And Professor Zapata, thank you again for being here. Uh, I'm sorry that spring break is over and you have to go to class, but thank you for being here for this short time. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Robbins. Um, we have a couple of very exciting um, uh, presentations now. And um, so we, as Dr. Robbins mentioned, we're gonna hear from uh, Deborah Jackson Taffa shortly from her new memoir. Um, but before that, we have a performance from R. Carlos Nakai. Um, and I'm gonna introduce him and he'll come up and play some songs for us. Um, of Navajo Ute heritage, R. Carlos Nakai is the world's premier performer of the Native American flute. Originally trained in classical trumpet and music theory, Nakai was given a traditional cedar flute as a gift and challenged to see what he could do with it. Nakai began playing the traditional Native American flute in the early 1980s and has released more than 50 albums in his career, with 40 on the Kenyan Records label. Nakai has earned two gold records for Kenyan Trilogy and Earth Spirit. In 2014, Kenyan Trilogy reached platinum status the first ever for a Native American artist performing on a traditional instrument. In addition to solo appearances throughout the United States, Europe, and Japan, Nakai has worked with guitarist William Eaton, flautist Paul Horn, pianist Peter Cater, composers James DeMars and Philip Glass, and with various symphony orchestras. While well-grounded in the traditional uses of the flute, Nakai has explored new musical settings, including New Age, World Beat, jazz and classical. His cross-cultural collaborations have included Tibetan flutists, uh, Tibetan flautist Nawang Chikechang and Hawaiian slack key guitarist Kiola Beamer, as well as Japanese folk group Wind Traveling Band. He was recently begun working again with his world beat jazz group, the R. Carlos Nakai Quartet, including Will Clipman on percussion. Will's a poet, we know him. Will Clipman on percussion, Amo Chip Dabney on keyboards and saxophone, and Johnny Walker on bass. R. Carlos has earned 11 Grammy nominations and 10 NAMA awards, a Governor's Arts Award, and an honorary doctorate from NAU. Please help me welcome R. Carlos Nakai.
I belong to the mountain people. For those who don't speak at the Baskin or Ute, I was born near a volcano. We moved into this area from Alaska, as they call it today, many centuries ago, moving from Polynesia all the way north to see what was up here. Unfortunately, we never got to go back home to Chile and Peru and say, you people need to come up here. There's all kinds of stuff up here, food everywhere. We were cut off by changes in the environment, changes in things that happen with what, what most people refer to as colonialism, but in actuality, it's um, other people discovering new places to go on vacation, more than likely. So with the mountain people, we remained in place primarily, but there were seven bands of us in the, what they call Four Corners region. Many of the tribes that go from where we are all the way down to, I would say maybe around Tierra del Fuego, we all speak dialects of the same language. They vary because we ran into native people who lived in those areas too. And they showed us many things. And I was showing a little thing about this color on my fingers and said, do you know what this is? I was especially interested in the natives. What do you think this is? Oh, it looks like something stuck you in the finger. I said, no, it's a very important color for us. And it's a very important color for many other tribes who utilize this material. It grows freely around here. So we found ways to survive and make things that were useful and make different colors and designs that, like in poetry, speaking about one's observations and how one feels in the world. It's, um, what do you wear? What do you wear? what represents what you are inside yourself. I started with a very simple little whistle made from the ulna in the forearm of the golden eagle. It's a signaling device used by young men when they're becoming of age. And so the young men today make a lot of noise too. <laughs> but the, um, <clears throat> it was used when you had stood alone in front of a number of elders, men and women, and said, I belong to this family of people. I'm a mountain person. We call ourselves mountain people. I was born for, or in other words, by other family, the one that just provides the raw materials for my mother's, all the, all the matrilineal community, for the people who live in what we call pueblos, little communities of little houses. And with those people, we lived around I'd say Western New Mexico into Eastern Arizona and then all the way to the Pacific and down where the Kuchans come from. So we learned to live out here too. And we communicated with the, um, with the um, other Pueblo dwelling people along the Rio Grande and, you know, and then the Arapahos and Sojela and Coara people of the plains, the Western plains, and we learned from them how to survive well too. So with that group, you know, there are many families and I belong to the Deer Kiva in that family. So that's the group that I would go to when I go visit in Zuni, New Mexico.
Yeah. When I stood before elders in both the Athabascan and Alaska and in Northern Arizona and down in Zuni, then I was given the right to carry this thing. It's not sacred. It just means that now I am one who will guard the family of my mothers. So I belong to a matrilineal community. That's what this represents. It's not sacred. But what's sacred about it is the person it came from gave its life for us to carry this, to guard families. So we spend much of our time moving around and learning things. So a very simple little whistle song. In other cultures, they have the same thing. I guess the one that really attracted me was when I was in the military and I was stationed in Pearl Harbor, and then went on a carrier, went into Japan, and I found they use little whistles too. And one of the young people in that community guarding the last um, um, plan leader of that community, he would play the hachakiri, a little tiny paper whistle, down in the moats when they were dry. And the people who wanted to take over that community would hear that and they could never find him. He would be there before daytime and he would play for a little while and he would go back in. And so everyone uses these. I will be in Scotland. They have eagle bone whistles too. And my clan there as a Crawford, you know, is like, okay, so this is used by everyone on the planet. Simple whistle, but very important on many levels, like poetry, like talking about things. It's the same thing. There are words that I could use. Ma sama ta uya ke ima hia beke oto ma hio o tavi beke ta mo ba hia ta. And then I began two songs on this little whistle. It came to us from people who had throwaways when they were inventing the first rock and roll music, but they wanted it louder. And so they sent people out and said, go make a bunch of these in different tunings and we'll put them all together and then we'll make this loud music. The pipe organ, that's where this comes from. They left the throwaways behind with the Haudenosaunee. They said, you can have these, put a few little holes in them, and they do this, see what you can do with them. Many of the Plains tribes and the Woodlands people today on the Northeast and around the Great Lakes, they designed all these, so they turned into sound sculptures. So even in that way, we took the social music of our sacred family songs and they said, can you play this song? You know, that family, they have this ceremony and they talk about their history. Um, it's like the seventh song in before they take a break to eat. Can you play that song? Um, yeah, I think I know that one. So that's where all the traditional songs on this instrument come from today. But the songs I played for you, because I was invited here, by people who are putting on this presentation of discussing how my mind works. I thought, I'm going to do my own songs just for you from here and from here, and I'm gonna give them to you. So those are for you, just for you. They will never be played again anywhere on the planet. So I've given you a gift. Writing and reading very important gifts. That's how we learn from each other. I went to school here for a little while, working in a Native American studies program. I wish it was a full department, maybe one day. 
I met two people that were very important to me. They're no longer here, but they taught a lot of what I do today in the world. Robert K. Thomas and Vine Deloria Jr. Those people are very still, even when they've gone on in their journey, still very important to me because the philosophy is be yourself, live in your own world and be of service to others. So thank you very much for inviting me here, Tyler and others. And um, for all the natives here, keep writing and keep telling your stories because they're the most important stories on the planet for you. They can be shared, but they also will reveal your philosophy. This is how I feel about being in the world. It's a fun place. And in that place, you will become the child that you were when you arrived here. So, thank you. Carlos, thank you so much for those gifts. Um, Carlos came in and showed me his fingers and said, what do you think this is? And I thought, oh no, something's on one of our chairs. Um, and then he let me keep puzzling about it. And then finally I figured out it was cochineal. Um, so I give myself a B minus on that, but, um, but we figured it out. Beautiful, thank you so much. And thank you so much for speaking about families and the importance of families, um, because that's where we turn next. Uh, and I'm really excited to welcome up to the podium Deborah Jackson Taffa, a great friend. We've become good friends through this work and thinking about this event and also celebrating um, this memoir, uh, but also your work uh, with the Institute of, the, of um, American Indian Arts in Santa Fe and the work that happens with writers there, um, which is one of the great incubators for, um, for, for writers that we know of. And we're so grateful for it. So many students from that program uh, we're here this weekend launching books at the Festival of Books, celebrating new books at the Festival of Books. Um, there's a bright legacy that comes out of that creative writing program and all the artists that do work there at IAIA. Uh, and we're so grateful for the work that Deborah does there. So Deborah Taff Jackson Taffa's debut book, Whiskey Tin Tinder, is out from HarperCollins. It has received praise from Oprah Daily, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and Elle Magazine, along with other outlets. She's had fellowships from the uh, National Endowment for the Arts and Prose, the PIN America, a public space, McDowell, and the New York State Summer Writers Institute. She received her MFA in, non in the nonfiction writing program from the University of Iowa. She's editor in chief at River Sticks Magazine, and she's the director of the MFA in creative writing at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She's a citizen of the Yuma Nation in Laguna Pueblo, and she is a great, great friend of the University of Arizona. Please help me welcome my friend, Deborah Jackson Taffa. Thank you, Levi, Tyler, Christina, and Paula, all the people who did so much work to get me here. Um, Joan. And, uh, my esteemed tribal elders who are here, thank you so much for being here. My father, Ed Jackson. Dad, can you stand up real quick? Yeah. I'm a little nervous. I, uh, I give readings a lot, but um, I don't know that anything has ever meant as much to me as today. It, um, it means a lot to be back here in the Southwest doing this. In the beginning, before there was land, sky, and shoreline, before the sun, moon, and rain, and long before the Thana Otham and Hohokam people and the Yaqui people stewarded the ground we stand on today, the world was formed in story. The world was formed in story, and since that beginning, humans have spun tales sacred and profane, uplifting and not. Speech and imagination are imbued with power. The stories we tell shape the world, contribute to our evolution, and build our individual identities. We become through the stories we tell. We remember our dead, 
speak of our wounds, heal our pain, and repair our lives through story. Stories strengthen our children and grandchildren. By seeing themselves on television and in books, they come to recognize that their lives matter. I have written this book, Whiskey Tender, for all those children who, like me, came after the assimilation era when the government sought to move families like mine off the reservation for blue-collar jobs and an enormous migration of Native people took place, a massive relocation that splintered us from our own people and broke many children's relation to their own tribal traditions. So my reading today begins before my family left Juma on the morning when my two oldest sisters headed off to St. Francis Elementary School for their first day of school. The day before Joan and Lori's school started, I wept. I was a nervous child and hated the idea of my sisters climbing onto the school bus without me. I imagined them cookied and milked in their classes while Monica and I sat in our dirt backyard. By dinner time, mom had given up trying to console me. She'd grown impatient with my tears, which only confirmed my fears about her mercurial nature. According to her, I was acting silly. People had survived much worse. After eating dinner, we went outside and sat on the porch. It was dark and mom switched on the outdoor light, attracting an eclipse of moths over our heads. She said it was time to go to bed and then started talking about dad's time in welding school. She said one night, about six months after they'd started dating, dad had told her he was moving away to Phoenix and wanted her to come. The federal government had sent a BIA or Bureau of Indian Affairs officer to the Yuma Reservation with information about a program designed to relocate young natives to big cities. The program was called the Indian Relocation Act or Public Law 959, and it had been around since 1956. At the time, Dad's father was the tribe's business manager and president of the Arizona Intertribal Council, and he was adamant that Dad and his siblings take advantage of the government's willingness to pay for, it, for them to go to trade school. I told him I couldn't move with him unless we got married, Mom said. He wanted to go to Lutz Chapel, where the Hollywood stars eloped, but I told him he was crazy. I had to get married by a priest. Mom said she'd started crying because she didn't want to leave Yuma, but Dad said it was his chance to learn a skill and get a decent job. Mom looked at me directly, emphasizing that Dad wasn't scared to go to trade school. He was excited about learning. The BIA officer had played a promotional video that showed a native chef in Chicago boiling lobsters and a native hairdresser in Los Angeles opening her own salon. His brothers had chosen to study heating and cooling, but Dad liked the idea of welding. Dad said he wanted to stay out of trouble, but it was hard. No one made a living wage on his side of the river, and he was surrounded by rowdy brothers and clan wars on the reservation. Didn't she want to get ahead like everyone else? After our wedding, the program helped pay for our move to Phoenix, Mom said. And the government worker there was so nice, just like your teachers will be nice. They were met by a woman in high heels who took them to J.C. Penney in Phoenix. And mom said the only funny thing about her was the way she exaggerated her enunciation like they couldn't understand her. Here is where you buy things like utensils and towels. The way mom said it made us laugh. But I didn't like her story because it showed me how she misunderstood me. I hadn't been crying because I was afraid of school. I was afraid of staying home with her when she grew sad. Mom explained that once dad finished welding school, they moved back to Yuma because the fancy foreman job the BIA officials had promised failed to emerge. And dad refused to stay off reservation for anything less. Mom didn't admit that dad was still struggling to find a decent job in Phoenix or that many employers in Arizona were prejudiced. And there was more mom didn't tell us. The feds wanted to move us to cities so they could dismantle our tribal governments, which would allow them to develop reservation land and make it taxable. 
The Relocation Act was part of the government's termination policy designed to disappear natives into mainstream America. A federal report associated with the law promoted blood quantum guidelines as a means of disappearing us even further. Relocation would encourage intermarriage with non-natives, and once a kid was less than one quarter native, they would no longer be allowed to enroll in their tribes. If blackness had historically been defined as one drop to entrap more slaves, not identifying people as native meant more land for the taking. By the end of the century, the number of native people living in cities rose by 64%, with many of them homeless. By and large, the relocation program failed to spin reservation lives from rural poverty to city gold. But it succeeded in isolating many people from their families and culture. Yet mom talked about the prog program like it was a positive experience. Anyway, it was good that dad didn't find a job in Phoenix, mom said, because right after we returned to Yuma, I got pregnant with Joan. My oldest sister, Joan, arrived smack dab on my parents' second wedding anniversary. To celebrate their second anniversary, mom and dad had caught a ride to the Yuma County Fair with one of my uncles. Mom's due date wasn't for another couple of weeks, but having to walk six miles to get home after her skirt-chasing brother ditched them on the midway, she went into labor, and that's how Joan came into the world. Mom said the doctor was surprised when he saw that Joan was born with a tooth, just like a little vampire. My parents' second try produced another sister. She was given my mother's name Lorraine, though everyone I knew called Mom Rainey, because she was fair-skinned and looked, took after the Herrera side of the family. In all her baby photos, Lori's head looks flat and square as Frankenstein's monster. A lump grew on Lori's chest when she was just a tiny thing, and the doctor had to remove the cyst to be sure she wasn't dying. Their third child, the sibling born right before me, was a boy who they named Edmund after my father, and he did die. An old Yuma Indian nurse everyone called Bulldog was on duty the night he was born. Bulldog got her nickname for the way she guarded the babies like they were her own. She wouldn't even trust mom to hold him because the delivery had been so long and hard. Mom said she begged, but Bulldog only agreed to hold my brother up in the doorway for a quick glimpse before taking him away to the nursery. Dad and his six brothers had gone out to celebrate the birth so no one was in the nursery to see how pale the new baby was getting. Hours later, he chirped a small cry and Bulldog went over. Taking a closer look, she realized not even mom was that fair and called the doctor. The old Indian hospital wasn't equipped for surgery and my brother was sent to Yuma Regional Medical Center in town. When mom heard, she grew hysterical and they had to sedate her. My brother had a congenital abnormality, a hole in his diaphragm, no separation between his heart and his guts, meaning his internal organs were all jumbled up. When the doctor came out of surgery to tell dad it was over, his son had died. Dad went into the parking lot and punched a dent in the car door. A few days later, dad walked to the car again. He opened the dented door with a white cast over his fist. Mom at his side with bandaged breasts, funeral finished, and the little casket buried. They stopped delivering babies at the Indian hospital after my brother died. And this is how I came to be the first member of my family born off the reservation. I was named Deborah after the girl on the little Debbie logo because when I was born, my family was living behind the Dolly Madison Cakes and Wonder Bread store and my two older sisters loved the discounted cupcakes they sold. My parents had been hoping for another boy, but when they realized the name they'd selected couldn't be given to a daughter, the button-nosed, blue-eyed girl on the cupcake box popped into Joan's head. She said I looked exactly like the little Debbie girl at the Dolly Madison store. I obviously didn't, but she was persuasive with her argument, and that is how I got my name. Still wanting a boy, they tried again not long after I was born, and Monica arrived 13 months later. That was when Dad told Mom if she had another girl baby, he'd throw her out the window. Here, Mom stopped telling the story to give a wry chuckle that my sisters seemed to interpret as, your father is so clever with his jokes, 
and which I always read as, one of you will definitely get thrown out the window, and it will probably be Dee Dee because she's the one who never behaves. Dee Dee was the nickname they gave me as a kid. Time for bed, Mom said, slapping her thigh for emphasis. You two want to be at your best for school. We went into our bedroom, said our night prayers, and climbed into bed. When she left, I stared at the ceiling, thinking about how lonely it would be without Lori and Joan to take care of me. Being the eldest of 15 kids had been a job, and Mom was exhausted. She was always kicking us outside during the hottest part of the day when there was nothing to do but sit in the shade and stare at the imperial sand dunes. The desert's expanse felt limitless, and it invited my imagination. But there was pain in the isolation as well, because I wanted more attention from my mother. Sometimes her impatient with, impatience with us was founded. Once, we forgot our crayons in Dad's car, a green Chevy Nova with hiked-up wheels, and panicked when the crayons melted on the floorboard in a puddle of black goo. We sopped it up with our hands, and not knowing where to wipe them, spread the mess across the roof of the interior. Our fingers left little bird-hopping prints that faded to asterisks over time, petroglyphs preserving the memory of us as kids. But sometimes she cried for no apparent reason at all. Then she would go into her bedroom and lock herself inside. I lay awake listen listening to my sister's soft snores. Unable to sleep, I finally got up and sat by the window where I could hear the wind blowing. I imagined the imperial sand dunes shifting into unrecognizable forms overnight. It felt terrifying how fast the world could morph into something new. Mom's mood was always changing, and now Lori and Joan were leaving me for school. Today, as we dedicate the Poetry Center, I'm thinking that the imperative to create art must always rest in the knowledge of our death, that moment of inevitable surprise, the breath that makes us realize, if we didn't already know, that writing is never something anyone does to build a career. It's something we do to figure out what it means to be human and alive. In Pueblo, my grandma Esther's language, there is a word, woitsiki. It means, for life's sake, we do this. So remember to remember a kind of consciousness that is essential to community. Woitsiki asks, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? With the memories of those who have walked on, and here I am thinking of my mother, Lorraine Herrera Jackson, and my grandmother, Esther Antonio Jackson, we thank the university for memorializing our people and the Quetzal language. May we hold to the spirit of respect for each other's stories. May we recognize that they are all American stories. May we remember that healthy societies need narratives and counter-narratives if we are to exist side by side in peace. Thank you. It's beautiful, Deborah. Thank you so much. One more round of applause for Deborah Jackson Tapa. I want to invite us at this time to come out to the sign uh, outside. Oh, I'm so sorry. One more. We're sorry. We have. Uh, thank you for this. Thank you, Tina. Um, one more remarks. Um, um, I want to invite up to the podium Jonathan Cotin, a tribal council member from the Fort Yuma Quetzal tribe, who is working hard to travel to be here this morning. Jonathan, welcome. Please come up. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my fellow council member, uh, Gloria McGee, who's also here with me. And um, I'd like to uh, also uh, send regards from President Joaquin, uh, Vice President Hall, fellow council members, uh, White, Medar, and Smith. They are not able to be here. Um, it's always good to be here on the U of A campus and uh, be recognized. You know, last time I was here, I got to see all of the tribes from Arizona, all of our flags displayed, and that was something uh, really nice. Um, 
So greetings and warm welcome to all guests, faculty, students, and members of the University of Arizona community. I stand before you as a proud representative of the Quetzal tribe, and it is an honor to be a part of this momentous occasion. Today marks a significant moment as we gather here for the unveiling of a symbol that embodies the rich tapestry of Arizona's native nations and languages. In the shadows of these walls, where words transform into verses and stories come to life, we come together to celebrate the vibrant spirit of our native nations, particularly the Quetzal tribe. As we unveil this sign adorned with the beauty of our ancestral language, we pay homage to the poetic essence of our heritage. Our native languages are not merely words. They are vessels of our stories, traditions, and sacred connections to the land. This initiative, a collaborative effort between the University of Arizona and our native communities serves as a beacon, casting light upon the importance of linguistic diversity and cultural resilience. Let this initiative be a testament to the power of language, the resilience of our people, and the enduring connection between culture and creativity. May the poetry that flows through these walls be enriched by the echoes of our native tongue, and may this sign stand as a reminder of the diverse voices that contribute to the mosaic of Arizona's native nations. May this unveiling ceremony mark the beginning of a new chapter, one where the echoes of our native languages resonate across the campus, bridging gaps and fostering a deeper sense of cultural awareness. Together, let us walk hand in hand towards a future where the tapestry of Arizona's native nations is not only acknowledged, but celebrated as, a, celebrated as an integral part of the University of Arizona's identity. Thank you. Beautifully well said. Thank you, Council Member Cotin. I want to invite us all to the sign now for the unveiling, which is just to my left outside of the building. As you head down that walkway, you'll see the sign right on the side. If we can gather there on the sidewalk, uh, we'll have the unveiling at that space. Thanks so much. <laughs> 